con thiện thương yêu Thời gian trôi rất nhanh Thấm thoát mà đã hơn một năm rồi Hơn một năm mà con phải lìa cha ba mẹ và hai em Bởi bàn tay độc ác kỳ thị của hai người bắt lương Làm cho gia đình ta tan nát Đỡ cho con phải đau khổ ra đi Đỡ cho ba mẹ và hai em Một nỗi buồn vô tận Thiện, sau, con, sau khi con bị giết Gia đình mình thay đổi rất nhiều Mặc dù những sinh hoạt vẫn bình thường Ba mẹ vẫn phải đi làm y như trước Các em vẫn đi học Nhưng thiếu con Ba mẹ và các em sống như ở địa ngục Ngày qua tháng lại Từng giờ từng phút Ba mẹ rất nhớ con Thương con Chúng bóng loài quê toàn hồn niềm dứt sạch nghiệp ba kỳ chứng dương cùng tan tan ngân kia không còn à, tặng Nơi đề tử He, uh, he took a deep breath and then he said, there's no easy way for me, for me to tell you this. When he said that, I couldn't feel anything. I was going, oh my God, you know. I was all shaking and I felt so numb. I said, it can be, you know, you, you're mistaken. It can't be my brother. And then he said that um, that morning they had found a body of an, a young Asian male. And I said, no, it couldn't be, you know. It couldn't be him. It's just not possible because there's no way he could, you know, he could, dies at, then at such a, a young age and then um, he wanted me to identify a picture of my brother instead of going to the coroner's office to identify the body they asked us to uh, look at that picture and I said I, I can't I just can't look at it so my um, my dad um, looked and, and identified that it was it was him my dad was all screaming and at that time I couldn't feel anything I just I just sat there in shock the detective pulled back the picture, and I th he I, he knew I didn't want to see it, but um, he he didn't cover the picture completely. I saw half of the Polaroid, and I saw my brother lying there. They cover all the wounds to protect the to see how to protect um I guess evidence, and um, I saw him there lifeless, and it's just shocking because you know it, it's his body's there, but you know where where is his spirit? I had to call my mom at work, and she was at the supermarket or something, and she wasn't there yet. And I told him, I told the workers that to, for her to call me, as soon as she comes back. And then when she came back, I didn't want to tell her what happened. I told her she has to come home fast, um, and I, I didn't want to have to have her feel the shock, you know, and, and have to drive home. I said I told her to come home really fast and stuff. And she said, did something ha bad happen? I said, I said I just need you to come home really fast, and I don't want her to ask, ask me any question. The hardest thing that night 
was telling my mom and my brother what happened to my older brother. Last time I saw him, like uh, 28 January at 7 o'clock in the morning when we went out of house and he he was asleep, but he uh, woke up and he followed us to ask us uh, what uh, we need him to do today. And I said I need him to open the store only and um, to stay around there about one hour and you can go away where you want and come back home. And then we came back home about two o'clock. I was happy I saw his car parked in, on the street before in front of the house. I was happy because he, he's in house. But when I came home, I asked my daughter waiting. He said uh, he went out to take exercise. Normally when he goes rollerblading, that's for deep thoughts and exercise. It's like his time is so um, structured and, and scheduled that he, um, he wakes up early every morning. He uh, brushes teeth. He does this little exercise. He eats very, very healthy. He drinks orange juice. He does not drink Coke. Uh, coffee once in a while if he goes to the coffee shop. He, does not eat, uh, he doesn't eat a lot of fried food. Um, and um, like things like, like the, the hot food that like you're talking about, he doesn't eat those things. Um, uh, he he exercises a lot, and he and he spends spends most of his time in his room reading. In the morning, he'll be reading and writing, like writing little things. He keeps he keeps everything like very 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 organized. He keeps letters, um, of what people send to him. He makes copies of his letter that he sent to other people. Or some not all the letters, but the, some the ones that he thinks are significant. Dearest Antun, as I am writing this letter to you, your death is still unreal to me. I keep thinking you are away at school or traveling afar that I will see you again one of these days. More than a year has passed. I miss you dearly. It hurts a lot to think about it, so I usually block it out and don't deal with it. Regarding our family, life at home is somber. Bamid cries all the time. I feel so bad for me. She loves you so much when you are alive and miss you so much now. Ty is doing better in school. He's not learning Vietnamese anymore because you are not here to tutor him. He missed you so much. I think he's the one that took it worse from your death because he doesn't understand where your spirit is at. One regret that I feel strongly about is not telling you that I loved you. I know our family wasn't as close as you or I would like it to be, but I want you to know that in my heart, I've always loved you. I wish I was able to embrace you and feel the comfort that you've always brought me. You've always been a person that I've looked up toward to and wanted to be. I would like to say that I'm coping with your death, but I'm not. I would like to say that I'm moving on, but I'm not. Right after we moved to the United States, I kind of, I was kind of young, too young to remember much stuff, but then I remember everything as being um, fun, but then I look back now and it wasn't as fun as I thought because uh, we had like great difficulties in our family because we just came here and uh, we didn't really speak English well and uh, we didn't have the money. And so uh, my, my parents worked um, night and day just to uh, keep us sheltered and keep us fed. Even my brother at the age of 13, he got a job at uh, my uncle's store where he worked and he would save his money f for the family, but not for himself. He was, he was never really a type of person to do things for himself. I remember he and I one day would just, uh, he picked up a f football from one of the neighbor kids and he would try to teach me how to catch a ball. Throughout the day, he would just throw me the ball and I would, could not catch it. And, but then he was standing there teaching me, telling me, this is how you catch it, this is how you hold your hands. And, we worked out on it for another four or five hours. Then he, uh, then I, eventually I kind of picked it up and I was, I, I can remember that day very clearly because that's a, a day that he and I shared. That would be one of the first times I remember um, doing something with him in America. I brought up an idea for him. I said, you know what? If you go to law school and, and know about law, one of these days you could be an ambassador back to Vietnam. And his eyes just lit up, you know, and I knew, I knew that's what he wanted to do because he had talked to my parents about um, wanting to go back to Vietnam and teach and, and work there. He had 
an ongoing conflict with his parents regarding his education and his future. On the one hand, his parents wanted him to enter the medical uh, health field, or at least the legal field. And he was a little more bohemian than that. He wanted to pursue any path that could most help him help Vietnam. One thing about Tien, he has a very inquisitive mind. He's eager to learn about anything that he believes is good. He doesn't set himself blindly to, okay, this is my religion, that is my religion. He gave me books about Christianity for me to read because he knew that I'm Buddhist and he is Buddhist himself. But he uh, spent time discovering, studying about other religions as well. I know within my own family, my mom would tend to um, brag to her friends where her kids go, um, uh, where I study, where I'm, like my sister, she studies at UC Berkeley and uh, for some reason, even though our parents are not educated, but they know where the good schools are. <laughs> they don't know the struggles that we go through. And, uh, and it's especially very hard for us also because we don't have that um, model. We've never had a role model of someone who's uh, gone through college or gone through the process of being educated. Oh, I think that part was predetermined. He came to UCLA with the determination to, uh, to be a pre-med and to go to medical school. Tien uh, shared with me about the pressure about the parents. If he didn't make them into med school, how much he would disappoint his parents and how much his parents, uh, how the parents would not, un would not understand if he tries something else. He always tried, tried to tell me, are you sure you want to be a bio major? Because you should do something that you really want and you should enjoy what you do. And my, personally, I thought I just wanted to be like him, so do what he does. But then um, after a couple years of school, he asked me, what do you, what's your interest? And I would tell him, I'm interested in maybe working with computers. And he said, then he started telling me, maybe I should take more computer classes and understand what I want. So I, I started taking the uh, computer classes and I found out I liked it more than biology, but then uh, I never really dropped biology because I want to finish it um, for my self-fulfillment uh, and in a little way for him too. You know, education opened your mind. About his second year, third year, he started to look into other things. And then I was the one who really recommended him and sort of pushed him to have a second major because it's, it was not easy to have a double major at UCLA and he could do it. So he ended up uh, have a double major in English and in uh, biology. And being a double major student, his mind became even more open and uh, he started to see other things and he started to think about is medicine is the only thing. Uh, in the first summer that I knew him, Teen went to Stratford-upon-Avon and went to this Shakespeare Festival. Now, that's pretty good. Uh, I don't expect I'll ever be going to, let's say, classical Vietnamese opera and understanding what they're saying. And uh, he made quite an effort to understand and to appreciate Shakespeare. And I thought that was quite marvelous for someone who's faced with the absolute torture of trying to get into a medical school in the United States, regardless of their ethnic uh, or personal or family background. So I was quite surprised when he didn't get into a medical school in the United States. He had a high average. He had more than completed the kinds of things you have to do to be considered by a medical school application committee. He was the head of the Vietnamese Student Association at UCLA. He was a leader within his community. And he was absolutely top material for a physician. I could not believe that he'd been rejected. He did not lose focus, but uh, he wanted to explore other things. Because uh, going to medical school required a lot of devotion. And you, can, you really cannot do other things. But Tien at that time was like standing at the door open to the world.
a newspaper article came out. And what I saw was a picture. They cut it off. There was a dog, there was the feet of the policeman, and there was his legs. And they had him covered, and they, they just cut off the they cut off the picture so that only half of his torso was showing and that I saw his legs. And he had these he he was a sporty guy, you know, he had these muscular legs and I was like, Oh my god, those are his legs. You know, and he still had his rollerblades on and and it, it hit me and I just I just lost it. I lost it. And I, it still didn't really strike me until I, I went to his room and it wasn't there. I still walk through the house trying to understand what happened, but then uh, I asked people questions. I asked my father what happened. He just said, your brother's dead. Your brother's dead. I walk, I walk through the hall and I, I, I can feel like a cold, a cold, uh, I feel cold around me. I feel cold in my arms. I feel cold in my feet. It's, it just feel like I, I, it feels like a place where I don't want to be. It feels like a dream that I'm not having. And when I walk to my room, I walk past his room and I see it and I see it's all empty. And that, that's, that's not something I, I want to see. So I usually just turn away from his room. But then um, there are days when I go in there and sit down in the middle of the room, just look around and just sit there and smell smell what his room smells like so I can still remember what he was like and keeps part of him in, inside me. At the time, we didn't know who had killed Tin. Uh, we didn't want to publicize the address or information about the family in terms of locality. So we thought it was a better idea to begin the whole vigil at the tennis courts. The investigators had told us that all the, um, pretty much all the evidence, or most of the evidence at the crime scene, pointed to somebody that Tin knew um, as being his assailant. And we were so worried because we could not think of one person that Tin knew that would ever do such a thing. But we had to deal with that um, because that's what we were told. Um, we spent nights together because we were scared of going home by ourselves, sleeping in apartments by ourselves. We did everything with at least two people. I was so masochistic at one point that I tried to go through the motions of stabbing. You know, at the time the detectives told us that he was stabbed about 12 times. Well, it turns out he was stabbed about 50 times in reality. He just didn't, they just didn't tell us. If you could so horrible, just go through the motions, you know, one, two, three, I counted, and I got sick inside, you know, this is sick, how could they do that? Đầu tiên người ta nghĩ một thanh niên trẻ đó, Việt Nam mà chết đó, là có liên hệ tới gang, đúng không? Bác đi hỏi bạn của nó, rằng xem thì là nó có một cái gì liên hệ tới gang hay không? Cho tới một hôm thì có một, uh, um, cái, uh, một bà nha sĩ, mới gọi điện thoại cho bác. Là bà nhà sĩ đó quen với lại gia đình của Thiện. Nói rằng thì là chị phải nói trên radio đi, chị phải đem cái chuyện này ra, chị nói ra radio đi. À, là mình phải binh vực cho thằng Thiện. Thằng Thiện nó không thể chết vì phải nó liên hệ tí khen được. Nó không phải là người có dính dáng tí khen. Đó, mấy người đó nói như vậy. Thì bác nói, tôi muốn nói lắm. Thật sự tôi muốn nói lắm. Nhưng mà tôi không được phép nói. Tại con giám đốc trong Thiện Thanh nó nó ông nói rằng là có cái hậu quả rất là tai hại làm cho sinh viên Việt Nam có thể vì cái cái tự cái cái người Việt Nam bị là người Việt Nam cho nên thấy bị kỳ thị như vậy họ sẽ làm chuyện lớn lên thôi thật ra tôi không coi tôi không thể làm gì hơn là tôi chỉ biết theo dõi và đến để xem đến khi nào thủ phạm xem ai is a former president of the Vietnamese Student Association at UCLA. Police are now saying they, they have a, a very strong lead in this murder case. But they are still not talking about motive. Live in Tustin, Doug Kriegel, Channel 4 News, Jess.
I remember <laughs> thinking in my mind how spoiled he was. His full-time job was to study. And um, um, his parents provided for him. And um, even, well, <laughs> I, I say this because he, he would take his laundry home for his sister to do it instead of doing it for himself. And that really pissed my friends and I um, a lot when he, f he told us this, that he didn't do his own laundry even though he was 23 years old at the time. And we used to tease him on that, that um, um, in Vietnamese terms, he was a công tử bộ, meaning like he was like the prince you know, of his family. He, uh, he had one special character. She, she, he want to eat the with the hit, hit bomb cooking. And hit hair, he want, I cut for him. He don't want to go to shop. <laughs> every year, every month, Every, if the hit hand longer, he, he told me cut for him. He doesn't want to anybody cut. <laughs> One time he told me uh, he came back from uh, Washington, D.C. on a plane. They have good food. But he said, I didn't want to eat uh, on a plane. I, I'm waiting until you go home. I eat your food. He told me that. that and I love him very much. And I remember. Um, his dad, because um, when Tian took me to his dad's store, and there was a shelf, um, unfinished shelf, laying around, and I remember Tian wanted to finish it, but his dad wouldn't let him finish, or in my mind, his dad wasn't, or didn't want him to do manual labor. <laughs> wanted him to study. I, I, I think that, that was the message that I got from his dad, that his son is not gonna do any of this manual labor things that he was doing, but instead he wanted his son to be educated and to go on to be a, you know, an educated professional. One day after he'd gone back home to live in Tustin, he showed up with lumber, a power drill, a box of long mm, screws, which are really more like nails than screws, and a power saw, and, he, and, and in about an hour out and back, he constructed a bookcase, which you'll see in there on the way out. It's uh, about eight feet tall and accommodates uh, some of the books that I like to look at every once in a while. And uh, I had to work at that time. I was working on some project for somebody, and I'll go out and check him out in the, in, the, in the back where he's making this. And he was enjoying himself immensely. And I was thinking, you know, I'd like to see this side of him take over. And uh, he, he did, he built that thing like a craftsman would do. Uh, and I was impressed with the kind of, uh, in addition to this physical grace that he had, his ability to do practical things like this, he would take that, that power drill and put a little Phillips head and long nail screw kind of thing and go like that and he'd say, that's not going anywhere. That's not going anywhere. And, and the... <laughs> which is a phrase I guess he picked up from a shop teacher or somebody that he admired, or maybe his dad says that, I don't know. But that's what old kind of carpenter guys where I grew up would say to the hammer and nail and say, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> I have planted a tree for Tian. And uh, very often, about a few times a week, I come and visit the tree. So uh, that's how I deal with his death. So I, when I look at him, look at the tree, and when I really physically feel the tree, I'm in touch with Tian. It has red leaves, and it, the flowers blossom around between January and uh, March, between around the, the Vietnamese New Year. And it, co coincidentally, it was during the time that Tian um, left us. So every year during that time, it won't blossom. Dear Tian, remember our first day at UCLA? You and I somehow managed to get into the Volvo tennis tournament with only one ticket. Do you remember when Steph and Edward popped the tennis ball toward the fan for a winning prize? The ball magically went straight into your hands, but you dropped it. I reached out and picked it up for you. 
Our friendship started in the same manner from that day. You pick what I drop, and I pick what you drop. A few years back, um, when I was still Tin's roommate, my father passed away, and I went home for one week. And it was during the midterms week. Midterms are important at UCLA. I mean, it's everywhere. And I received a call late at night from Tim, uh, informing me of the matter. And uh, he and I uh, planned, called, set up a trip to San Francisco, San Francisco uh, to be there for our friend in his time of grief. Uh, yes, we were waiting in the uh, rental shop. Uh, waiting for the paperwork to go through. Uh, we met uh, a man who seemed to be from Africa with a thick accent, so I assumed he was a foreigner. We, he, we asked about him, he asked about us. Uh, very funny, I thought it was very odd how he asked if uh, Vietnam had safaris. I was perplexed because, you know, narrowly, only, the only safaris are in a uh, in Africa, but I suppose you can take it broadly to mean, you know, any any time you bring a gun running around shooting animals, that can be a safari. And Paint wasn't quite sure, so he says, oh, I'm not sure. And the man was, I, I think perhaps setting this whole thing up, was very rude and declared, you know, that we were stupid and that uh, perhaps all Vietnamese were stupid. And well, Paint uh, wasn't too happy about that. And he says, well, maybe I'm stupid. But Vietnamese are very smart, you know. All the strength that I have comes from Vietnam. There's no need to say such things. It's been a bit over a year since I last saw you at the closing of Culture Night 96. I remember how happy you looked and how you were slightly embarrassed when I sent a funny wink you away. Couldn't help it. You were introducing me to a girl. I spoke to you the Thursday before we lost you, remember? We talked about planning a reunion of all of our old UCLA friends, how we could get a slideshow together and sit around reminiscing about old times. All of us spoke of such a reunion. I just wish that we had an opportunity to follow through before everything changed. Culture Night is a huge production. It, the budget's about fourteen, fifteen thousand. 15,000. Um, I think when we were coming into VSA, we were all 75ers. We came over in 1975, which meant that we had all grown up over here. And I think because of that, we had gone through this period, like in high school and, and in our youth, where we had... I guess we had lost part of the culture, and the culture night would bring us back to home, back home, basically. Thì lần đầu tiên bác gặp Thiện, thì bác thấy thứ nhất, Thiện hỏi bác, nói chuyện với bác một câu như thế này. Bà Thiện nói rằng thì là, thưa bác, cho tụi cháu thuộc rất nhiều về những văn chương của Shakespeare, mà tụi cháu lại không biết gì về văn hóa của Việt Nam. Tụi cháu biết rằng văn hóa Việt Nam có cái gì đó nhưng mà tụi cháu là không biết cái đó là cái gì cho nên chúng cháu cần phải biết cái đó là cái gì thì khi nghe Thiện nói như vậy bác rất mừng bác nghĩ rằng là có ít ra nghĩa là có một số sinh viên như Thiện đang cần những người như bác hoặc là những người biết nhiều về văn hóa Việt Nam thì phải có những người sẵn sàng để mà truyền đạt cũng như có những người sẵn sàng để mà thu nhận và thiện đang ở trong tình trạng là một người à, muốn tìm hiểu về văn hóa của Việt Nam và bác là một người đang đi tìm những người đó để bác truyền đạt. He held these meetings and he would make Culture Night the number one agenda. And he'd run out and said he'd come out with those bulletin boards and just say, sign up, sign up, sign up for this. You can be a dancer. You can do this. 
in Vietnamese, there is this expression, it's ding ang am, and it's, it's, it's ding is feeling, and ang am is like brother and sister, or um, brother and little brother, and we all had that. Um, it's, just, it's just a feeling, it's like family. We had our own family in BSA. He was a president. We didn't know. We didn't know anything. He he worked at the uh, president. Mm -hmm. I only knew he worked for associate, but I didn't know he was president. When we came there, I saw him to uh, came up on a stage to talk with the people. Oh, I was surprised. Oh, it was great as 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 a. A lady that I've seen some shows, you know, but of course, I even feel that the professional actors and actresses downtown, all those pretty shows that I've seen, what you call memory, is that called a memory? That shows that, that uh, it's about the cat, everybody wears a tail. That's one of those uh, big, it's called musical. Yes. Yeah, that musical, they acted well too. They can't beat this one. The, Vietnam, the Vietnamese uh, musical show I saw two months ago, it's just perfect. They, they should take it out and go on the road. In those days in England, we, we call it repertoire. Everybody that was involved, the staff here that um, Tin was Culture Night director, has made an effort to always come back for Culture Night. So I think I've attended my fifth culture night now. And um, this past one, we had, we had somebody fly in from Texas. We had, oh, people fly in from everywhere to attend. At the end of the show, he, he, he pulled me aside and said, um, this show and uh, my major in, in, in English literature is the two most proudest thing that he has ever done. And he was really happy because he, he uh, immersed himself in learning his own culture and learning other people's culture. But he especially loved learning his own culture. The personal identities, which we have, have been there since we were, we were born, which seem to have faded away, but which we now know with certainty that we can never be apart from. With this identity, we can confidently come to you and to triumphantly express our colors. And hopefully tonight we can share with you a diverse culture which we can only partly understand. Good evening, friends and family. We are proud to present to you someone very dear to our hearts, Lee ming <coughs> For those of you who knew Tien, these next few moments will rekindle memories of a dear friend. For those who did not, we beg your patience as we honor our beloved friend and leader. We remember Tien's leadership as director of VSA Culture Night, 1992, as editor of Lin Lab, our Vietnamese student newsletter, and as president of VSA academic year 1992-93. We remember his abundant talent, graduating from Tustin High School with a 4.5 GPA, earning degrees in English and biology. Before we leave in, in Vietnam, the uh, 1975, I was the official in the Republic of South Vietnam. After 1975, I had been in year about six years. I uh, went home in 1981. Uh, when uh, my husband was in jail, and Tien was about six years old, we try to visit him every two months and every year until six years. They, they, they like a lot like, uh, to visit the father. I told them they, they did very well in school. I will, talk, I will take them to, to visit his father. 
when he was in jail. And because they miss uh, his father very much. So he tried to study very hard. My wife told me to prepare everything for we escape my country. And we left my country in 1982. We came to uh, uh, Indonesia, the land camp. We've been there about nine months. And we uh, came to United States in August 1983. And we uh, sit in Thurston here from 1983 until now. We have been here about 13 years. You know, before we, uh, we um, escaped, I decided if we um, if die in, on the sea, that okay, better than living in Vietnam with communists. He said, I have um, some good news. So when he said that, I, I knew they must have got the murderers. And um, they said that uh, because of the one letter that the guy wrote, um, um, they were able to track him down and, and, uh, and arrested him. Um, the police did not give us the, the letter at the time because it was um, in evidence. Um, a few days after, uh, um, Los, the Los Angeles Times got a whole of the letter through the Tustin, courtesy of the Tustin police. Um, they published the, the letter, but before they did that, they gave us a call and telling us to warn us that it was gonna be in the newspaper. My brothers and my, bro my little brother and I and some of Auntie Ang's friend did not want my parents to read it because we didn't wanna to have to have them go through it. But that day I did read the letter and when I read it, it was like a disbelief because it was so painful because um, what he was writing almost describe all the emotions what my, my brother was going through. And and I try to imagine myself being there and being in his position. And it's like just when I come to, when my mind goes there, it goes to that tennis court, it blanks out and it, it makes me think of something else. Um, I knew, I as I read those words, I knew those things happened to him. But all the pain and all the feeling that I, I would have felt in another situation, I couldn't feel it. And I was so relieved that it was all along nobody that we had known and that it was a random sort of act of violence. But I was also so angry that these people had really no reason to do such a thing, and they did. And what made it even worse was that they were so young, 17 and 21, and Gunnar Lindbergh was, I mean, he was a guy out there with, warrants out for his arrest and and he could have been stopped and he wasn't he was pulled over a few days or like a week before tin was murdered and he used his dead brother's id that's totally unacceptable it outraged us to see that um nowhere in these papers were they saying that this crime was being investigated as a hate crime so we try to get the word out to um the Asian Pacific Coalition at UCLA, different campus organizations around, our friends. Um, we try to get people to write letters to the mayor, to the city of Tustin, to um, pressure them into investigating this as a possible hate crime. Uh, I can't imagine what any punishment for him would be just. Justice could be served for society and for the community. But justice will never serve, will never serve for my family. Because I feel that Lindbergh can die a million times and that can never replace my brother's death. They, they look at Lindbergh when uh, he sat in the court by um, before of us. He couldn't see us, when, but when he came back to his room, he turned around to saw us, and um, Christopher. Um, sometimes he went out and in the room. 
the police took him uh, to went out and we in, in, he saw us. He looked at us and I looked at him and very upset. When we look at him, he he go he, he looked another way. He he looked away. When we look at him, he turned around. He didn't want to look at us. Somewhere along the line, I sort of feel sorry for the killers because somehow I, somehow I think that they, they are like me, like you. They are people, but they happen to have such a cold heart. They did not have a chance to have their thoughts corrected. You know, they were young. So somehow I feel that uh, I blame it to the society, part of it. Of course, of course, the major part is from from the killers, you know, their fault. Their, there was a, un, we cannot condone that kind of actions. I'm in my peace with that. I don't necessarily believe in it. I don't know exactly how I feel about it. Um, but it wouldn't, I could go to sleep at night and close my eyes if he got the death penalty. And I think that um, his family, Jane's family, at first it didn't want the death penalty. They're just very gentle people. They're, they're a great family and they're so strong in it all. And at first, you know, they didn't want that at all. They didn't want revenge. And I don't think, I don't believe in revenge. I don't think it does anything. Revenge is, you know, a continuous cycle. It just comes back to haunt you. Um, and they didn't want it either, but after they read the the letter that Gunnar Lindbergh wrote, and you know they saw how badly not only did he kill, but then he you know disgraced him afterwards, they said, okay, well, you know we don't care anymore. Hmm. You know when uh, when somebody kills somebody, I think when he. Somebody who killed my son, they have to die. If they put in jail, the government have to spend money for him. Yet people, I think, they cannot alive in here. He have to die. His uh, friends didn't allow me um, to, to read the newspaper, but I, I, I read. I say, why not? Because I want to know how he killed my son. He killed my son very brutal. Why my son didn't do anything wrong, you know? I heard, I read a letter, they wrote like when they took the knife out, my son said, no, 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 but they didn't stop. They stabbed stabbed many, many times. From today, my son has been died for one year, one month, and 16 days. We, since then, we have been living in hell. You know, the, everything still the same, the house still the same, business still the same, but without him, <laughs> we, we feel very weak. <laughs> Uh, you know, my husband always sick. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we couldn't work strong like before when he was here alive. Every minute I miss him very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Although I know him die, but I wait and wait him to come back. <laughs> writing to you direct in my happy memories in the yester years of 1993, 94, and 95. You were introduced to me by Duke near Nguyen, 
whose sister is married into my family. Then you, Tian, you came along and given me the pleasure of knowing you better. Tian, I think of you with such fond memories. Your easygoing manners, your nature, your intellectual power. Tian, you, your other very fine quality is, is your music interest. You usually, when at home, you would dash to my grand piano and you will play your favorite tune, such as the theme that uh, in somewhere in time. Although you don't read music, but you certainly had a good ear for it. Tian, I did enjoy my writing to you. And you know, I write to you again and again and in love and light. Your mama, Lotus. popular music, and I used to study classical music. I listened to his play, and he's, he always say, if I play the wrong chord, let me know, you know. I said, no, I couldn't find any mistake in your playing. And, and he plays it real good. He tries some other pieces of music, but I remember this one very well. He liked this one. Then if, Tian, if you're by my side, uh, you would agree with me, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Someone asked me once that, um, was it worth it to, uh, for my brother to die and have, and raise awareness for um, the Asian community of the hate crimes against the, the Asian community? And my response to that is that I would never trade my brother for anything. One of the dreams I had right after, uh, I guess a few months after he died, it was so vivid Everything was so clear. Um, I, I was sitting out in the living room, and uh, he came up. He came in the front door, and I look at him. And I said, "You're dead. What are you doing here?" Well, God let me down to visit for a while, for a little while. I can't stay long. And then uh, we went on to carry a conversation. And I said, "I told him, you know, do you know what's been going on um, with uh, the murder murderers?" And I told him, you know, it would be so funny that you go to trial and you testify against these people and that you, you tell them that they killed you. And and I told him, do you know the jury will never believe that that, uh, that you're back to here to tell them that? And then uh, and then he didn't say anything. And then he looked at me and he said, he said, you must, be, you must have been really scared, huh? And I, I said, yeah. And then he gave me a really big hug. And then when I woke up, I, I could feel I could feel the pressure. He had on his arm, his arms around me. I, I, I felt it so strongly, even after I woke up, and how what the hug was like. And that's how vivid my the dream was. And I, I felt really good, really, really good after I had that dream. Rồi sẽ có ngày ba mẹ lên đó gặp con. Bao nhiêu lời con rõ mẹ dùm bút nơi đây. Chúc con được dồi dào sức khỏe và vui vẻ. Thỉnh thoảng có dịp con nhớ vợ thăm gia đình. <cười> Sáng nay, trước khi giải viết thư này cho con, mẹ thấy con đứng trước mặt mẹ trước giường ngủ của mẹ. Mẹ cảm ơn con rất nhiều đã giúp đỡ cho mẹ. Mong con tu hành thành đạt mẹ của con. Tạm biệt. <laughs> <laughs>